Okay. Yes. Okay. So let us uh, recapitulate a little bit about our last class, where fundamentally we were talking about the physics of light and also i have mentioned there are the two aspects of the lighting in illumination engineering what we are going through how it is engineering with respect to the other applications so that means here primarily the two type of approaches like one classical approach and second is a paradigm shift that is we have talked about the human centric approach we'll be talking about the platform so in our classical approach mostly we'll be talking about the quantity of the light so whatever type of design whatever type of control system you will be preferring that will be mostly based upon the quantity it's a quantitative approach so a quantity of light doesn't mean only a physical portion physical parameter which will indicate there will be several parameters and their connectivity so we'll see the terminologies like illuminance, illuminance, those are interconnected, but we need to ensure all the parameters for a traditional part of light design. So uh, in this, the traditional approach of the classical approach ones we'll be talking about, fundamentally a designer's role should be to achieve that. So that's why before we are going for the design and its evaluation part, we should know what are the different radiators we have, how to evaluate a radiator, uh, the term I'm using radiator, because last day we already have talked about light is just a subset of a radiation. So that's why we know the 380 to 780 nanometer, what we call visible band. This portion, what our human eye can see, can perceive. So just before that, we already know that ultraviolet A, B, C categorized like this. Just next to our visible region, that means after 780 nanometer, we have higher region. In this way, we can find the alpha, beta, gamma, all the wavelengths can be converted and can check whether that comes within 380 to 780 nanometer, what our human eye can see. So in our classical approach, all the parameters will be related to the visual requirements only. And once we are going to visual requirements only, we should first know the type of source, type of light source. But already I have told you, light is a subset of a complete radiation. So we will be going to identify the total radiation coming out of the source. And that should be compared, that should be evaluated and fundamentally that will be represented compared just the way i, I mentioned in last class that uh, in our uh, maybe in the class seven or eight physical science book there was a chapter units and standard and the last unit what was defined was candela so while defining a candela uh, the first practically realizable black body that is a platinum black body operated at its solidification temperature of 2042 kelvin so that was introduced so that is how a candela was defined referring that standard black body why black body because the black body is a source for which not only it's an 100% radiator, 100% absorber, there is no reflection, there is no transmission. So that is a classical definition of the black body. And we also know that black body in a real case doesn't have this 100% reflector, 100% radiator, 100% radiator absorber, no reflection. So this is this model is not possible in a real. So that's why the, we need to take care of the some deviation for classical black body definition. That is, we have gray body, we have selective radiators, we will be defining them. But the necessity of the black body is that it's not only the 100% radiator, 100% absorber. This, uh, the black body is referred here because this is only a radiation for which the wavelength versus radiation is a standard card. And there is another variable that is the operating temperature. So that is why black body is being referred here several times. So if somebody asks you that why we need to refer black body once we are going to the this uh, topic like illumination engineering, 
because this black body should have that property where the wavelength and the distribution is presented as a form of proper distribution okay so the total energy or power density coming out from a black body can be represented for a linear range of wavelength as a function of operating temperature so that is standardized so that's why we need to refer black body it may be a mathematical model it started a long back during 1890s religions model kirchhoff's model max planck's model wen's model there are different till date we have several black body models but mostly the black body model talks about in my x axis there will be the wavelength for which we can declare it like a black body and my x uh, y axis it positively should be the energy density or power density or maybe intensity so all of them are basically aiming that either the power density spectral power density which is a very regular practice we indicate it like in lambda so lambda stands for it's a function of wavelengths so it's basically represented like that so this is standard for a black body all the black body model whatever we have just an example in i think you are being able to see my screen so this is basically a q it was represented like in but as a function of temperature so here you will be able to see uh, this one so this is the x axis where lambda and here the m lambda is represented in watt per centimeter square per micrometer so this micrometer micrometer that means if we find the area under the curve they will nullify each other fundamentally it will be the watt per centimeter square or maybe watt per meter square that means it will indicate power density so that's how the area under the curve is so important for this case so this is the fundamental property of black body in every cases for every mathematical model whatever we have physical black body like platinum in every cases we have this curve which we can refer for standardization unfortunately this semester we couldn't perform the uh, this color temperature related measurement experiment uh, but sorry it, it should be there in the third year first semester so we couldn't make that laboratory so in that laboratory we are supposed to measure the color property of the source today we will be talking about much more elaborate that how a color property of the source can be explained so there are very significant term we got color temperature so basically the color of the source can be quantified as temperature it should not be a very red green we say it doesn't make sense because it's absolutely a perceptual term how do i know what the red i am talking about i should have a very specific technical term which will help us to quantify the color so today we will talk about that portion more elaborately this is that's how we need to refer a term called color temperature color is related with the temperature but definitely it sounds that somewhere there should be a relationship between the operating temperature and color so for which case this is possible this is the only option that is there if we have a black body or maybe it's a selective radiator it's not perfectly working like a black body but the laws are little bit deviated with respect to that that's why we can call selective radiators or gray body defining them separately so in that case basically there is a very clear relationship between the operating temperature which is a variable but i know that for each temperature my wavelength versus power density can be standardized so if it happens then only i'll be able to know if we can start changing the operating temperature how that power density start changing and if your power density start changing that means the color of the source will change just this uh, car whatever we have right now in front of us this is the best example here uh, 0.4 to 0.7 actually this is it should be in a micrometer it should be in a nanometer to make it more specific 380 to 780 nanometer so within that span whatever energy is coming 
that energy is basically have a specific color. 318 to 719, it's a different color, different wavelength corresponds to a different color. So don't think that wavelength means it's a it's a mix of color. So there will be the different range of color. So that's how at each wavelength we'll be having the different color. So it starts with the 318 nanometer to 718 nanometer. Within span, the different colors will be represented. Now it is very clear whatever color actually we are getting from a source. So this is basically nothing but it's a mix of all colors. That's how your third year experiment, whatever we have missed, third year first semester experiment, this was basically talks about the spectral compositions present in a light source. Spectral compositions. So that means if we are being able to disperse the color present in a source, maybe by using a prism, maybe some graded uh, prism. So in a different way, how we can make it a proper dispersion phenomena and that's how we will be able to see all the spectrums whatever are present in a source. So that, that's how you will be able to know how much contribution red, green, yellow, but those are absolutely a relative term. Red, green, yellow will not work. We should definitely be able to do, mention that what are the different wavelengths we have in a source. So that's how, why I am telling you, just to tell you one thing that it is very clear in your picture that 1000 K, if it is operating temperature, there is no question of light for the black body. But if it is 2000 K for this black body, there will be a contribution of the color. So definitely whatever color we are getting, that will be the mixture of all colors, whatever present there in the spectrum. Now, if we increase that to 3000 Kelvin, the color will shift. If it is going to the 5000 Kelvin, the color will most shift. If it is a 10,000 C, this portion, that means the color near to 380 to 70 nanometer, that will dominate the region. Whereas, if we can think about once the same black body is getting operated at 2000 K, so under this condition here, near 780 nanometer wavelength will be dominating. So, this is very clear that there is a change of color. Are you getting my point? Anyone? Please unmute yourself and respond. Yes, sir, we can understand. So, that's how basically there is a very clear correlation between the operating temperature and color and this is only possible with the black body because for the black body interestingly this m lambda curve itself is a standard curve and it is a standard function of operating temperature just here in my few slides so i can show you in different models just a model of plants model so here you see the E is basically in a form of energy you have already have told you primarily represented at M, but it sometimes we can represent that like energy density sometimes as intensity parameter may vary but fundamentally it will indicate the actual energy so that's why here is a term e lambda t so here my function of lambda as well as t so the t will be there so that is the only advantage why different type of this is a plan's old model so in, in this way in different different models we can have different lambda different t so the operating variation of the operating temperature t will change according so that's why there is a very clear and direct correlation between the operating temperature and the color this is only possible for the black hole. so that's how for any real life source ones we are going to compare we should refer this black body because we know for the black body there is a dedicated relationship a clear uh, correlation between the operating temperature and the color okay so that's how even the stephen Boltzmann's law also says the similar thing so if we can come back to our discussion so that's why why we are talking about radiators or conventional source that's why we need to refer black body every time so if somebody asks you that why we need to refer black body and why we will be referring that in case of any real life light source so that is the reason this is not the reason that black body is an 100 percent absorber 100 percent radiator so this uh, definition whatever we have gone through in our last level physics that is a separate thing but here why we are using 
black body for sake of our application this is the reason because here for this black body there is a clear relationship between the operating temperature and, and the color so this relationship will make it much more specific so that's how the first part that is the black body we need to refer to, which we can use for different different type of radiators see black body once we are saying uh, why we call it black body can anyone just tell me why we, why the black term is getting used sir because in a perfect black body all the uh, light uh, coming to it is absorbed and nothing is radiated and the total is radiated yeah that's that's a theoretical we can say but at the same time i can tell you it's not always it should be black because once we are talking about the black body means we are talking about the black body which is basically working within the 380 to 780 nanometer but it doesn't mean that every time my black body should work within the visible big region only so it may possible that i have a black body which actually behaves like a black body the property is the radiation law everything is applicable for uh, maybe in the range of ir region maybe in the range of uv region but under visible region it doesn't behave like a black body so that's why once uh, we'll be talking about the black body properties uh, in, um, not today but maybe in the next class we will make it very fast because this most of the things are known to you so that's why I, i will not spend too much of time with this but in this case you will be able to know that mostly once we are talking about the black body properties this is applicable for a range of wavelength of frequency mostly it is a short range of wavelength of frequency you will not be going to get any universal black body because this is quite visible here once the definitions are actually formed or developed mostly for a smaller range of frequency or wavelength for which it was behaving like a black body but that's why it's quite feasible that whoever is working like a black body in the uv region maybe during the this special visible visual region visible band it will not behave like a black body so that's why it is not mandatory that every time it should look like a black so that's why here also why we are going to select the black body for our radiator why i am telling you repeatedly this term just to tell you that we need to refer black body for radiation purposes <coughs> so and the radiation Mami, class is, class. And, so the type of source i am using see i am not using the term light source i am using type of source mummy class chal raha hai i am using accordingly i am going to select my radiator such a way i can make a proper comparison okay so that's how the yeah. black body radiations are very important but the Now, blue class chal raha hai to talk about blue this blue relating lumen to what this is the most important and interesting part let me finish up this portion this is a spectral power distribution of the different lamps so lamps or light source so that means here once we are going to refer we need to consider a black body mostly in the 380 to 780 nanometer region but it's not that number one it will always be have like a black body within this region 380 to 780 nanometer maybe a portion it's not entirely 380 to 780 maybe say 500 or maybe some in it may work like black body number 2 whatever radiation curve we are going to refer for the black body even if it falls within the 380 to 780 nanometer it may also vary anybody tell me why why it may vary can you please ask again sir yeah the question is that even 380 to 780 nanometer if this is the region there is a possibility that my radiation curve may vary it's not a fixed one i am referring a black body radiation i am using that for sake of my calculations just like after a few minutes we are going to do but here it may vary for the black body the radiation curve may vary even we did the 70 nanometer out just we need to have to do if we start changing the operating temperature it will definitely vary so that's how 
why we are using that particular curve even in the visible region we need to very precisely use the particular operating temperature otherwise we will not be able to compare even yes sir just by changing the temperature the curve varies definitely the curve will vary and that's how we will again come back so in the case of uh, just for i think uh, to share with you that we have in our laboratory is a device called spectro radiometer which help us to measure this uh, spectral compositions present in a light source but it's not in this way it will be measured in the spectral part distribution of so so you will be able to see there that is the jan company we have bought this one it's a very costly mm, we should be very much proud about not for the financial part we should be proud about because using that we can measure the spectral compositions present in light so but here you see uh, there is no term called photometer the term is mentioned spectro radiometer so that means it's a device which measures actually radiation irrespective of any any kind of um, energy any kind of wavelength okay so it's not light here it's supposed to be radiometer and so unfortunately i need to defer this one for this proportion in the coming days possibly we will not going to repeat any more but that's why the third year first semester laboratory experiment whatever it was assigned for you which we couldn't uh, organize here so that experiment was measurement of spectral compositions present in the light source the equipment which was used called the constant deviation spectrometer okay so the name suggests that spectrometer fundamentally and going in any laboratory how the equipment actually work the principle is very simple here we have used a prism for sake of dispersion and human eye by rotating the prism we have captured all the colors of based upon their wavelengths they have dispersed in a different dispersion angle we have gathered them and through a artist we have uh, captured your voice is breaking is it break <coughs> yes, just sir. let let me check whether this somewhere yes, need, sometimes now is it still breaking yes sir yes, it's sir. breaking sir mm, that is the main problem with the university internet once i take the class from my home i never get this kind of disturbances but i think sir now it's okay it's okay no, no, sir, now it's it is breaking sir <coughs> it's also Yes, just, sir. just uh, uh, let me check again. Is it now okay? Okay, sir. Is it okay? So, yeah, sir. sometimes it is okay. Sometimes it is again going. Ah, uh, that that's a problem with the especially with the university. I think in that case I can share my own mobile phone monitor to do this. Okay, let me check. If that's good that you have pointed out. If you are finding this problem, please initially point it out. So that's why I can convert the network from my mobile data. So here, uh, what actually I was talking about the fundamental experiment which we are supposed to do. Unfortunately, you couldn't make. In that experiment, we have used a device or equipment called constant deviation spectrometer. The idea was that. what are the spectral compositions present in a light source we are supposed to measure that okay so uh, how that can be done the principle is very simple we need to go by the principle of dispersion we all know so that's why we need a prism so and we have rotated the prism with, the ref with respect to an axis such a way all the different spectrum what were coming out of the wavelengths we can capture them through an ip so that was the simple principle how actually constant deviation spectrometer equipment works so in that case this type of experiments are called visual photometry photometry means measurement of light so photometry light related measurements are fundamentally classified in two way one we call visual photometry another we call physical photometry So, what is visual photometry? Visual photometry means one we are using the human eye as a sensor. 
our class two level uh, physics laboratory, if we have performed some kind of optics related experiment, what we actually done, we have used our human eye as a fundamental sensor. Maybe we have used some uh, optical assembly like a mirror, prism, lenses. Those are different type of optical accessories, but human eye is a fundamental sensor, whatever we have used. But there is another type of experiment, another type of method, which we call physical photometers. That means your human eye is getting replaced by a photoelectric sensor. So then only we can call it a physical photometer. So that means we don't need to have human eye. There are the advantages and disadvantages of both the type methods. It is very clear that mostly the light related measurements should take care of the human requirements. Now, once you are requesting the human eye with the photoelectric center, the question will come where the electric center can replicate the photoelectric from your it may be Sir, again, voice is cracking. Sir, yes, sir. Your voice is cracking. Uh, I, I cannot understand what you are saying. Okay. Let me just disconnect it again and reconnect. Okay. Is it okay now? Is it audible? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, uh, let me check once if it uh, repeat, then we will be switching off our network. So, because otherwise I couldn't find anything else. There is maybe the network issue. So, what actually we are talking about that this which portion you are being able to listen carefully? Which portion you have got? Anyone? Up to which portion you have captured? Hmm? Sir, we. Uh... We are whatever you have told. We have heard, sir. We stopped you as soon as you. Uh, okay, soon. okay. So that means fundamentally, once I was talking about this constant deviation spectrometer is a device which works like a visual photometer. Now I was comparing the visual and physical measurements, and there are merits and demerits. So it is very clear that. Uh, Visual measurements are the most accurate form of measurement because you are using human eye as a sensor. But the same way, the physical measurements are definitely it's a very much equipment based, sensor based. So that's why your photoelectric sensor will not be able to replicate the exact human eye characteristics. So that is a disadvantage with the photoelectric measurements or physical measurements. But at the same time, the visual measurements are very much individualistic in nature. Like I have my spec, so that's why many of you may have spec. So that means based upon your requirement, it, it will vary person to person. So that's why the physical measurements are most accurate in that sense, because it should not be person specific. So it, it can be measured using an equipment. But definitely how accurately your measuring data is captured by your photoelectric sensor that's how it differs just uh, it's not a price comparison i can tell you it starts with a ldr have you heard about the term light dependent register coming times once we'll talk yes, about sir. the yes sir yes sir yes sir we have some um, communication protocol topic also under this case so lighting control and communication protocol there also we'll be talking about few sensors and their technologies so they are ldr definitely this starting with the ldr and today's cmos technology will be compared but just for your understanding uh, we have ldr which is a very low cost one so if you go to chartney market it will cost hardly 10 rupees per piece and we have another type of sensor which is uh, called ccd charge couple device based or cmos based complementary mosfet type so
so that ccd and cmos type of sensors are quite costly so that's why in our laboratory we have a lux meter which can measure the light which cost around 5000 rupees made by a chinese company it's a basically silicon photodiode based sensor we have another one in our laboratory this is made by a german company ap and german company that, that can measure are the price is something like 11 lakhs so see the difference i am not comparing the that the accuracy to use for sake of our regular measurements they are not that trustworthy such a way we can rely upon the values blindly so whereas the lmt german made one which is so calibrated and it's almost replicate the human eye characteristics so that is why this kind of uh, detectors are most important now let us come back to our discussion why i am going to this because in coming days we'll be talking about those just to tell you that here our third year experiment was third year first semester experiment was mostly uh, focusing about the individual that means uh, visual type of measurements you are using mirror lenses whatever in our case we have used uh, different prism but human eye as the sensor whereas in this case what we have captured actually we have captured in x axis different wavelengths 380 to 780 nanometer and in my y axis we have got some colors okay so we have got at maybe at 600 nanometer there was a red present maybe at 510 nanometer there was a green present maybe at something like 490 nanometer region there's a blue present maybe around 560 there was a yellow orange present so that's how we were being able to identify what are the spectrum present by visual inspection it's a visual method okay but the discrepancy is that here we were only able to say that at which wavelength which color was present but we are not being able to mention how much of color or how much of energy at that wavelength or power density at the wavelength are you getting my point so with the visual measurements we will only be able to say there is a spectrum present at 580 nanometer there is a spectrum present at 620 nanometer there is a spectrum present at 490 nanometer but we are not being able to say how much energy or power density is present at that wavelength so that's why my y axis was missing there. so that is how we if we replace that with a physical meter that physical meter will help us to measure that y axis the power density so that is what we have the spectro radiometer it's mostly imaging optic it's basically a ccd based charge coupled device based equipment so this equipment is capable to measure energy or power density see i haven't used any light related terminology we'll be talking about some light related terminology very soon but here i haven't used any i am using the term called radiometer it will measure the radiation it will measure the radiation in a term of power density presented at each wavelength so what per meter square per nanometer for this equipment there is basically a concept of solid angle say i want to measure this source the equipment will form a solid angle with respect to the source so per unit solid angle how much power density is there this equipment measures that so that's why the unit is coming watt per meter square per steradian per nanometer so nanometer is a range of length. is it audible now yes, yes sir okay so that's why this model number is fake spec boss one two one one and yet is the german manufacturer who have manufactured the spectro radiometer so here you can see a real measurements what we are going to do we are actually performing so there was a light and that's directly giving so i'll be sharing that with all of you individually let's start with the most fundamental one so this is an incandescent bulb last day we were talking about the efficiency and efficacy can you recall yes sir 
so in that case i was telling you that incandescent bulb which is uh, about to get uh, obsolete very soon maybe because of some financial reason it cannot be made obsolete right now in our country but i think five more years maximum after that it will not at all be available in our country because we already have seen the as a life source is the efficiency is very poor but as a efficiency is concerned it's not that poor i have told you the example how it was used for sake of heating purpose but here if we can think about it's like a light source definitely it's very poor only 5 to 8 percent is getting converted as light let us see this incandescent bulb a 100 watt incandescent bulb is placed under spectroradiometer interestingly what spectroradiometer we have in our laboratory the spec was one whatever i have shown to you it can measure we have couple of spectroradiometers one can measure 350 to 1000 nanometer what does it mean it will mean a small part of uv and a big part of ir region it can measure so i am in six so that's how this particular equipment can measure a small portion of uv then the visible region and then a big portion of air so that's why it's a radiation to so device there is no question of light it's just a radiation if we see carefully what we can get the inferences number one for incandescent so bulb, how does it measure the radiation yeah that radiation is measured by using ccd sensor it's basically uh, imaging part that means there is a i am not go diverting to that uh, application part of ccd because we will talk about that during the sensor classes that is how ccd works just uh, before we are getting diverted <coughs> i can tell you the fundamental principle of ccd is just like you know the cmos technology so uh, here it will be converting the photon to charge so that's how the image whatever we have in front of that the source or radiator so at each point it will measure the pixel that pixel will be converted as charge and it will be actually stored in a ccd chip so the ccd chip will behave like a cascaded shift register i think you know about the term shift register yes sir so there is a gate terminal so the, there will be one CCD chip which will be focused towards the source which we are supposed to measure. So here it will convert the CCD device, it will be converted the pixel, that means the photon which actually carrying the pixel information that will be converted as charge and it will be stored at that. But in the next point immediately again a charge will come. So that's why how can I distinguish them? that's why immediately i have to trigger the grip and it will be shifting to the next register so that's how at each time we will be capturing the image it's imaging optics we can say so that's how it will measure the image as a form of charge and definitely it will behave like a capacitor bank so that's why the charge will be stored and finally there will be a calibration circuit which will be converting that charged amount of charge will be represented as a function of pixel and so at each wavelength separately it will measure and that value will be calibrated to draw this curve so in our spectroliometer interestingly i have shown you the curve uh, at the same time we are getting the magnitude of m lambda or radiance watt per uh, this steradian per uh, meter square per nanometer that at each wavelength it will measure separately in this way at each wavelength how much charge is there that will be calibrated as watt per square meter per nanometer so that's how our ccd based uh, spectrometer calib is calibrated okay so that's how for at each wavelength it will be measuring that and finally once it is plotted we are going to get this card the beauty is that here for the entire region, number one, for incandescent lamp, there is some portion. Number one, there is some portion of UV present there. Number two, the major portion is IR. So that's why we have seen that 
this portion is huge and this is not the entire IR, IR will continue. So it can measure up to 1000 nanometer, our device. So that's why here will be a huge portion with IR. And here if we can consider this portion, what we are going to get under visible light, there is a continuity. There is no discrete part. Definitely the value has changed more and more reddish in nature. So that's why incandescent bulb gives our reddish output. Whereas here continuity is getting observed. Are you getting my point? So there is no discrete or some kind of discontinuity in the spectrum. Spectrum is continuous in nature. Definitely, they are, the value is not uniform, that's not same. So that's why we have this kind of characteristic scar. So that is why incandescent bulb is considered to be the source which have almost continuity in their spectrum. That is a very important observation you should carry because later on we'll be talking about the two more color aspect of the light. So any query about this so far? No, sir. Okay. Now, this is very interesting. So what is that? We are going to talk about the color of a light source. Say, if I say it's a red, how can you define red? So I said red, somebody said green. So what there is are the X and Y axis, sir? Right, I am coming there. So this is called CIE color space. CIE, last day I have told you the International Commission on Illumination who are referring the standards for worldwide. So they have said that the color cannot be represented in a perceptual way. Color is a perception, right? So the red, if you say red, if you say the, the, there is a ball which red in color. So I don't know the what exact what shades of red you are talking about. There are different shades of uh, red. So we need to quantify them in a very specific way. So that's why CIE, they have recommended there should be a color space. So this is called CIE color space. It's just like a color palette. And CIE color space is represented by two coordinates. So this is basically a 2D color space where color space is plotted in a X and Y coordinate system. So this X and Y is called chromaticity coordinate system. So there is no unit. The function is that here, this, this is a standard color space, sorry. So if you want to find out the any color over the space, you can comfortably represent them with two coordinates. Just an example. I want to know this color. Can you follow my question? If yes, you sir. want to know that, yeah, if you want to know this color, you tell me how can I do that? So that means here the x coordinate is 0 0.6 and y coordinate is 0 0.3. So that's how any color. So now the red green is not the factor. The factor is that all the colors are represented as a function of x, y coordinates. And some of the colors, here you can see there is a CIE white point because we know the white is a composite color mix of RGB, how we are getting the white. So here the, that coordinate is also represented. That is a very fade one, I think, whether you are being able to see it properly, I don't know. Uh, so here it is, this is a very fade one, but this is a CIE white point. So here the colors are mixed to form a CIE white point. And the boundary of the color says, there are all colors present. This is basically the saturated color we call. Because those colors doesn't need any coordinates because they are exactly represented by the wavelengths only. So I was telling you a few minutes back that uh, while we are talking about the colors, those color can be represented at each wavelength. So just the way, see that 470, 480, in this way 500. So that's how you are going more and more towards red to more higher colors. So that is what we know the event on the black body radiation law. So if you have a shorter wavelength, that means you will be going for a bluish region. So that is how we have this kind of color property. 
So is it clear? So that's why any color can be represented over there by mentioning the x and y coordinates. Those x is x and y is called chromaticity coordinate. So that's why we need not to mention the red. I'll be only specifying a 0 0.6, 0 0.3. So everybody will be able to understand what color actually I want to be. But definitely this color space is required to be identified or standardized. It's not a variable thing. Okay. Now, there is another very interesting thing. Can you follow? There is a uh, color present over there. There is a line. Can you follow that contour? Can you see the contour? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is there is contour. So this contour is called actually Planckian locus. So what is that? So this is basically the max Planck black body radiation curve, whatever we have, Planck's radiator. So for the Planck's radiator, again there is a relationship between the operating temperature and the color of the black body for the max Planck's black body too. So once the color of a black body radiation with the Max Planck's body, if that is plotted over the same color space, how it will look like, this is basically represents that only. So that locus, this Planckian locus is an indication that if we plot the Max Planck's black body radiation for the different operating temperatures, if they are plotted in the color space, so that's how, how it looks like it shows in this case. It is very clear that if we are going with the more and more color, it will be shifting towards the shorter wavelength. So that's how if we are increasing the operating temperature, more and more operating temperature, it will be shifting towards the shorter wavelength. So that's how it is getting shifted like that. Clear? So that is how Planckian locus is indicated and there is a dot. Can you follow this dot? This dot is nothing but the measured value of my light source over the Planckian locus. How nearer it is to the Planckian locus. Is it audible? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sometimes I at least because you know that disturbances are there, we need to refer. So that is how the Planckian locus or Planckian radiator will work. We have uh, plotted the Planckian locus in the same color space and that's how it will look like. So that's why, again, I'm telling you, this is only that portion of Planckian locus which is visible. If your Planckian locus output is beyond that, it's obviously, I've told you that it's not only confined within this visible region, it's not plotted over here because it cannot be, it is not a light. So how color can be used to indicate that? So that is how here this dot indicates the actual situation the, of the your measured light source. So incandescent lamp is very close to the Planckian radiator, but it's not the exact black body, but it's very close to the Planckian locus. Uh, this particular color space, which was worldwide accepted during 1930s, but during 1964, CIE has changed that for sake of few colors, few of the coordinates which were not being able to represent it properly a color. So they have just made a coordinate shifting of this color space. So I am not going in uh, more elaboration because this portion is not included in your curriculum, the color emetry itself, but it's very interesting. I can explain this. So that's why they proposed XY can be used, but for few of the sources, U dash V dash, the similar chromaticity coordinate concept is used. The concept is exactly same, only the nature of the color palette standardization has shifted. But still date, here also in the similar way, Ankian locus is plotted like that. Only the position and the shape has changed. So that is the only changes, but we can focus on this particular color coordinate system or chromaticity coordinate system. Clear. So let us in brief see the other sources and then again we will come back to our discussion with the color temperature and another term called color rendering index. So this is so this is for the incandescent lamp. Now let us think about this is our compact fluorescent lamp. 
So here, this is what we call compact fluorescent lamp, CFL. I think many of you have seen the CFL. Yes, sir. So it is very clear once CFL is measured under that, this is a real measured data. So here you'll be able to see a huge discontinuity is there. It's not continuous in nature. Some Lewis content is higher, a very lowest, and that's how here almost there is no presence of that. So that's how here for this compact fluorescent lamp, our output is completely discrete in nature. And this is cool white. What is cool white? What is warm white? That terminology we are going to describe. But here, just see uh, the this one cool white is represented. Here, the same color space already have used, referred. So here, you'll be able to see the dot. Can you see the dot? So this is the position of your measured position of your cool white. So it is more and more whitish. Previous one was more reddish in nature. So that's why for incandescent lamp, you know. But it is becoming more and more bluish white. So that's that is going towards the bluish hue. So here in the similar way. This is warm white compact loads in lamp. So that is a you know the this is another variety of white, little bit yellowish white. We call warm white. So here also you can see a huge discontinuity is observed. And here the blue content is much less and yellow and red content is more so that means it looks more reddish in nature so that's how previous one was very close to bluish white it is again becoming a reddish. so that's why this yellow is your reddish white we go towards the red point can you follow so can yes, you repeat your voice yeah. was Ah, is, it, is it audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Also. Yeah. So that is what actually I want to say. That means here, if you come back to that case, there you will see it is become more and more yellowish in nature. So that shows that previous one was a cool and this is a warm white. So that means it's a yellowish in nature. This is basically the mercury vapor lamp. I think you, you haven't seen this. We can skip mercury vapor lamp. Uh, this is a high pressure version of the mercury vapor. This is very interesting. This lamp has a very special significance. Unfortunately, I can't take you to the laboratory. This lamp is a very unique lamp. This is not used for general purpose application. This is called low pressure sodium vapor lamp. So in our street light, the yellow light we have seen, so that comes under the high pressure sodium vapor lamp and this is a low pressure version. So here in this low pressure sodium vapor lamp, which abbreviated like SOX, SOX is basically a trade name. So if you measure that, can anybody tell me what, what is your findings about the SOX lamp? We measured using the same spectroradiometer. Anyone trying? Anyone try? What is the observation you have from this spectral, spectral power distribution curve? This is what we call spectral power distribution curve. So the maximum radiation is along these wavelengths. Anything else? The very important and salient points which is shown in front of you. Right. So this is a true monochromatic in nature. So almost there is a single wavelength present. Uh, if you magnify a very fade red is present here, but that's negligible. We can think it's a truly monochromatic in nature. I mean, uh, theoretically, it's a complete monochromatic source, but here it's not absolute monochromatic. If we measure, we can see some red, some very faint green are present there, but mostly it's a dominated by this golden yellow color. This is called sodium D line. So this is called sodium D line. D stands for double peak. One is at 589 nanometer, another one is at 589.6 nanometer. So that is what we call sodium D line. Okay. 
so that's a, and there is a peak in a higher region so that's why that is so far light source is concerned it is not that important but this is a monochromatic source so what will be the problem then if we have a monochromatic source with us if we have a monochromatic source with us what will be the problem then So we cannot see the other right so there is the question that how much you can see how much you can so there will be a compromise between how much you can see that means that will absolutely decide the color what you can see so that means we should have a specific color property of the source which will help us to identify that how an object color is properly rendered under a source. So that's why a technical property is required. This is called color rendering index or abbreviated like CRI. I can check possibly I have one slide for your um, better understanding the CRI. I think just give me one minute. Just see that one. This is a color wheel actually, color pyramid or color cones. So one, two, three, four. In this way, there are several. I have used this one, three, four, and seven. There are other between other sources. So here, the metal halide lamp, this is used for one. This is for high pressure sodium vapor lamp in our street light application, whatever we have. This is the low pressure sodium, and this is the good fluorescent or we can think about if we use a incandescent so what is your observation in that case here under this light source it was quite impossible to see the exact object color whereas here object color is known quite clear it is also very good this is not that good but moderate but this is the worst so that means we should have a color property which properly help us to identify the acceptability of the color. So this is what we call color, color rendering index property. So that's why a CRI or color rendering index property is being used. Okay. Color rendering index. Is it audible now? Yes. Hmm. So two type of index are there one we can call color temperature and another we call cri or color rendering index you if you are willing to take a note just only the two points you mentioned the two color properties we have for any light source that is what we call color rendering index another one or abbreviated like cri another we call correlated color temperature or color temperature abbreviated like CCT, correlated color temperature. Let us come to the points individually and that's how we'll be finishing the different sorts and their measures, SPD and color. The CRI, so the definition is that how exactly an object color is getting revealed under a source is called CRI, color rendering index. So it's a index it's a parameter which is used to indicate that how exactly an object color is revealed under a light source or rendered under a light source. So that's why if you say red, red color, what does it mean? Your light source should contain red in its spectrum. Then only the red color will reflect from the object and will come to your eye and you will be able to say it's red. So if your light source doesn't have red, then how it will be able to render the red color? Think about a case once we are talking about the low pressure sodium vapor lamp right now, which is very, very much shown in front of your screen. There you will see that there is no other color present in its spectral compositions. Then how it will be able to render the exact object color? So if you put a green ball 
if you put a red object if you put an a blue object how this light source will be able to render that because it doesn't have that color present in the spectrum so that is why the color rendering index CRI property for this low pressure sodium maple lamp is worst. Can anybody tell me which should be the best then? Any guess? Sunlight. Right. Natural daylight should be the best one because we know all the colors present there, big geo concept. But there is an issue because sunlight it, or daylight itself a variable turn throughout the day in a different time of day the color of the light you know sometimes we can have a very clear sky sometimes we can have a diffuse sky sometimes it's like frosted so that's why throughout the day throughout the season throughout the year the color of daylight varies based upon the way that's a clear sky if it is a clear sky at which time it is measured so that means it's a variable term so it is really difficult to standardize that and with respect to your natural light or daylight once you are going to compare your artificial light it will be really a difficult task once especially your daylight varies with respect to the time then what will be the solution daylight is best undoubtedly but we need to think about something which is very much available which is not variable like daylight can anything else so far whatever we have seen out of the spectrum can you mention anything we already have seen some spectral cause spectrum spec spd value of something some few sources anyone Right. So the incandescent lamp, we know definitely the value varies, but there is a continuity. We can't say one color is missing. So they are very much overlapped with each other. So it's really difficult to do the measurement using, especially for the incandescent bulb, where all the colors are very much mapped, but very much superimposed with each other, overlapped with each other, but there is no discontinuity. So that's why incandescent lamp is considered to be the best color rendering index lamp as an artificial source. With respect to that, rest of the lamps are calibrated. So that is why incandescent lamp is considered to be the 100%. So the color rendering index term CRI I was telling you, it is abbreviated by a function R suffix A, R A. RA is basically calculated by considering the incandescent lamp as a hundred percent. How with that scale, any of your light source can be ranked or marked. Are you getting my point? So your incandescent one is considered to be hundred percent with respect to that. How the rest are actually looking that is basically calibrated. So that's how if incandescent is considered to be hundred percent, then mm, then uh, rest like say your this warm white cfl this is in a range of 70. cool white this will be in the range of 70 to 80. and the low pressure sodium paper it is almost in a range of negative it's negative cannot be given it's something like one or two if incandescent is 100%, this is one or two. Clear? Yes, sir. So in this way, just at, uh, this is a high pressure sodium paper lamp. I will come to the color temperature later on. Right now, let us finish the correlated uh, series, the CRI. Then CCT term will come. This is also very important. So that is why high pressure sodium paper lamp or SON and its uh, spectral SPD are shown. This is what we generally see in our street lighting applications, especially YOLO street lights. Now this is getting replaced with uh, LEDs and uh, metallurgite lamps, but fundamentally, even in our campus, you will see the YOLO street lights. This is a spectral type. It is also, you will see the discontinuity, but it's not monochromatic like the low pressure version, isn't it? So here you will see the other, definitely the domination is for YOLO part, but the blue, green, and red, they are also present. Not very much dominated, but 
it's not like low pressure one which is basically monochromatic in nature so here also you can see the color is represented this is metal halide lamp so uh, this lamp this continued but here you will see the blue content uh, green content yellow content are to some extent made little bit uh, balanced this metal halide lamp is a light source which is very much used in our sports lighting applications once you are enjoying champions league sitting at your home you can see Lionel Messi is moving so fast and all the jersey textures to the texture of the ground are clearly visible that is because of the metal halide lamp is used so all sports lighting applications stadium lighting this is the only source because incandescent lamp is an it's an absolute impossible thought you can't have the inner so far energy efficiency is concerned if it happens that think about how many megawatts of energy will be required to illuminate a playground because here you need more and more light metal light lamp which gives you a much better color rendering index it will be in a range of 80 to 90 if incandescent is considered like 100 okay can you hear me yes sir <clears throat> so that is how the metal halide part your metal halide lamp which is very popular in uh, sports lighting application which is used so here you will see it is whitish in nature so that's why here the it is not in the yellowish region neither in the reddish region it's going towards the white this is a fluorescent lamp which we generally use in our um, daily life can anybody tell me what is the actual type of fluorescent lamp in our domestic what is the actual type that means fluorescent is only the fluorescent material we are using but what is the gas placed inside the fluorescent lamp Argan. that is basically a buffer gas but not the main gas this is nothing but the low pressure mercury paper previously i have shown you the high pressure mercury paper this basically the fluorescent lamp whatever we are using in our home that mostly home maybe in any application those are mostly the low pressure version of mercury paper so here also you see if it's a bluish white fluorescent lamp we call it cool white so here the blue content will be more this is a warm white fluorescent lamp where our red content here also the color rendering and region is almost 70 to 80 percent so in, if incandescent is 100 percent okay so that's how the different real measured different light source and their spectral power distributions are shown with you any doubt so far otherwise we will go to the correlated color temperature term by the way what what is the time of your next class 230 230 do you have it 230 you have next class yes sir uh, yes sir oh then if i am not leave you by 10 minutes you will be going to skip your lunch yes sir yes sir we have already skipped a little oh so five more minutes will it be okay yes sir all right sir thank you so that's how so that's why the new topic which i was supposed to complete today that uh, relating lumen to what possibly i need to skip today because we will be finishing up let me uh, talk about the correlated color temperature and within five minutes i'll be finishing up so correlated color temperature already i've told you if one property is basically called color rendering index other property should have mentioned like the color appearance of the source so color rendering index is related with the object color and here it related with the color appearance of the source so if the color property of the source is defined like one is a color rendering index another is color appearance so how the color appearance can be represented say i have a um, little bit yellowish white i have a bluish white how that can be represented one approach is very clear 
I'll be telling the term called warm white, cool white. The deep thing, being an electrical engineer, that this particular term like warm white, cool white, stay in this where you to get some color which is most Sir, you are not audible, sir. Sir, voice is disrupting. Yes, sir. We are not audible. Hello. Hello. Hi, sir. I'm on WhatsApp. Sir. Hello. 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 H